Hey, everybody. Good to be with you here in the room. Good to be with you who are online. That set of worship was amazing. Like, I am, yeah, I am, I am still feeling the chills right now. So, um, over the years of being in pastoral ministry, I have had the opportunity to speak with a number of people going through an identity crisis. I remember speaking with a man who his whole life was defined by his career, and when he lost his job and couldn't find one in that field, it was a real struggle for him. I remember meeting with a woman who, after 25 years of marriage, found herself going through a divorce and what that meant to her. Met with a couple who were dealing with an empty nest. They had invested, you know, the last couple of decades of their lives to their kids, raising their kids, and now they were all gone and they were dealing with an empty nest. And then I remember a guy who um, was really quite affluent and uh, then his business went south and his, his wealth kind of evaporated. And him sitting in my office saying, I have nothing. I have nothing. Which wasn't true. I mean, he still had his family. He still had sufficient funds to live on. What he was really saying, I think, is, I am nothing. I am nothing. Psychology defines an identity crisis this way. It says that when a person, an identity, an identity crisis is when a person becomes insecure about their role or place in society. We become insecure about our role or our place in society. And we ask questions like, who am I? Why am I here? What is my life all about? And so I think in some significant ways, there are those within the community of faith, those who are Christian, who are having a kind of identity crisis. We're not sure about our role or our place in the world. According to many in the broader society, when they hear Christian, the way they describe a Christian is somebody who is judgmental and cruel to anyone who doesn't look or act or think like we do. Within the community of faith, among ourselves, we are disparaging each other oftentimes. I've seen Christians who, in disagreeing over matters of faith and practice, behave more like MMA fighters in a cage match than as Christ followers who are trying to figure out how to love God and love other people. The Barna Research Group did a fascinating study a number of years ago. It was a five-year-long study. And what they did was they looked at attitudes and behaviors of Pharisees. And they listed five attitudes of a Pharisee, five behaviors of a Pharisee. And they did the same thing with Jesus, five attitudes of Jesus, five behaviors of Jesus. And they listed these uh, 20 attributes out. And then they did a survey across the country. And they said, as you read these, check off the ones that when you think of Christians or Christians that you know, check off the ones that you think of. And at the end of that survey, they found that 51% of people across the country, both Christians and non-Christians alike, 51% said that Christians behave and have the same attitude as Pharisees over Jesus. The president of Barna, a guy named David uh, Kinneman, in looking at this research, said this, the majority of Christians seem to be more concerned 
with what they call unrighteousness than they are about self-righteousness. Christians are more concerned about unrighteousness than self-righteousness. Jesus put it this way. We're more concerned about the speck in somebody else's eye than the log in our own eye. I see this playing out in our own denomination, the United Methodist Church. As we are in the process of dividing as a denomination over the question of what does it look like to love and be in ministry with people in the LBGT community. And rather than working together to figure that out, we disparage one another and we go our separate ways. So in this series, we're going to look at some of the basics of the Christian faith, what it means to be a follower of Jesus, and we're going to do it with the help of an old friend, a guy named John Wesley. John Wesley was the founder of the Methodist movement back in the 18th century. And not only the Methodist movement, he was a point leader of what historians call the Great Awakening that swept through Europe and over into the colonies of America, an awakening, a reawakening to what it means to be a Christ follower. It was one of the most significant times in Christian history, and Wesley was a point leader in that, and he still has things to teach us, I believe, today. So last week, if you were uh, listening in, if you were here, you know that we were talking about the names of God. And last week, one of the names of God we looked at was Jehovah Jireh, God provides. This idea of God providing is at the very heart of Wesleyan theology. And what Wesley understood was that the primary thing that God provides is everything that we need for life. Not just for physical life, but for relational and spiritual life. And all that God provides, Wesley put under this banner of grace. Grace. God's un merited favor, God's unearned favor. It's a gift. Grace is a gift from God. And God's gift to us begins before we are even born. God's gift to us. All of life is a gift, and it began even before we were born. So listen to this from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. This is what it says. Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity into the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to the end. God has planted eternity in our hearts. Now, what's eternal? Creation isn't eternal. The universe isn't eternal. Everybody, even those outside of the faith, understand that the universe had a beginning, a time where it all started. There was a time before it was, then there was its beginning and everything since. There's only one thing that's eternal, and that's God. God planted himself into the hearts of human beings. God's grace. God put this sense of himself, this reality, this identity of himself into every human heart. And we all feel it. We all have a sense of it, even though we all don't describe it that way. And the way that we, the way that we do live that out is we have this sense 
that there is something bigger, something grander, something greater than just myself as an individual. And so we spend time, we spend our lives really trying to find that bigger thing. And so maybe it's in a relationship with another person or our family or our community or our country or our tribe or a gang or a team, right? I mean, we, we so identify with a sports team. We wear their garb. We go to their sanctuaries to worship, right? And we scream and shout and sing. What is that all about? Like, I don't play for the Eagles. If they win a game, it doesn't change my life a bit. Fly, Eagles, fly. Right? We're, we're connecting with something bigger than ourselves. Something that gives our lives meaning. It's that sense of eternal. Something that is lasting, something enduring beyond just my time on this planet. And whatever that thing is that we put there ahead of God is by its very nature an idol. Something that we place where God actually belongs. So, then there's this disconnect. It's called sin. This reality of sin that blocks us from being able to see what God has planted in our heart. That's the nature of sin, that we don't see God because we have this sin nature that is also part of what we're born with, that blinds us, that keeps us from worshiping the true God. And so this is where grace comes in, all right? God's grace comes in at this point. So he's already planted himself into our hearts and now God begins to initiate a relationship with us. God wants us to be in relationship with him. And so he begins through the work of the Holy Spirit to initiate, to woo us, if you will, to call us into a relationship with himself. And this part of God's grace, this work that God is doing before we have any connection to him, before we have any relationship with him, this work of the Holy Spirit that God is doing before we come to faith is what John Wesley called prevenient grace. Prevenient grace. How many of you have ever used the word prevenient if you're not a Methodist with, you know, some sense of this? Not a word we hear very often, right? Prevenient. And really, all that word means is to precede, to go before. It is what God does before we come to Him. It's His prevenient grace. God's action comes first. God is always the initiator. God initiates and we respond. God initiates. And we respond. So there's a great image of this found in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, listen to what it says. Look, and this is Jesus speaking, right? So here's Jesus speaking. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. So get that picture in your mind, right? Who's initiating? Jesus, right? God. Standing at this closed door. The closed door is our heart. Closed off to the things of God. 
And Jesus says, I stand at the door and I knock if you hear my voice. So he's not just knocking, he's calling out. Knocking and calling out. This is prevenient grace. He is at the door of our lives and he's knocking and calling out, inviting us to open the door. In one of the most famous paintings of this scene, maybe you've seen it, Jesus is standing at a door and you can tell that he's knocking. And if you look at the door, you quickly see that there is no doorknob outside. The doorknob is on the inside. So Jesus can't open the door to your heart himself. We have to open it. God initiates, we have to respond. We have to open the door in order to let him in. God is the initiator, and we have to respond. And sometimes we respond in words, when we say yes to Jesus. And sometimes we respond by our actions, when we say yes through our actions, or when we say no through our words or through our actions. I remember meeting with a guy a number of years ago. He had started coming to the church, and he contacted me and said, you know, I've got some questions about the faith. Can we get together and talk? And I said, of course. So we set up a time, and we got together, and he was asking questions, and we were having a great discussion about it. And uh, after about an hour, you know, we said, hey, let's get together again. We set up a time. We got together a second time. More questions, more conversation. Um, I was really excited for this guy because they were great questions and it really looked like he was moving toward coming to faith in Christ or, or saying yes to Jesus. We set up that third appointment and uh, he didn't show up. And so I called him and there was no answer. I sent an email and a couple of weeks later I got a response and the response was, hey, I'm really busy. Um, you know, I'll reach out to you uh, when things settle down and I'm still waiting. I don't think he actually said no out loud, like, no, I've looked at this and I'm rejecting this. But it was a no by his actions. There's another guy, similar kind of thing. He started coming to the church and uh, reluctantly, which a lot of people do, you know, um, should be, I feel like it, maybe it should be part of our logo, right? Hope, we come reluctantly. <laughs> uh, right, so he, reluctant, but, you know, his wife and kids were coming, so he would come. His wife and kids started coming regularly. He would come occasionally, and, um, but over time, he began to think, you know, this isn't all that bad. Another part of our logo, hey, Hope, it's not that bad. <laughs> it's really motivating. And uh, as he would show up, you know, and he began to get acquainted with some other folks and, you know, spend time in the lobby and get to know folks in the lobby. And, and he began to develop some, some friendships with some guys. And, uh, and those guys started to invite him to help out. There would be some project they'd be working on, and so they'd say, hey, can you give us a hand? Sure, and he started showing up, and those friendships began to grow, and periodically one of those guys would say, hey, I'm part of a Bible study. Would you like to come? And that was a bridge too far with this guy. Like, yeah, no, that's not my thing. I'm really not interested, and that was fine. He t continued to come. They continued to engage with him, and um, uh, periodically one would invite him to a Bible study. This went on for about 12 years. 12 years. Eventually, I asked him, I was starting a small group of guys, and I asked him if he would come. And I said, look, you know, it, there's going to be about a half a dozen guys. You know at least three of them. Um, so you know what kind of guys they are. And uh, here's the thing. It's going to be a six-week study. I need you to commit to three weeks. At the end of three weeks, if you hate it, you're done. Right? So that was a low enough commitment, low enough bar. He knew the guys. He came to that, to that study. And he kind of liked it, but didn't say a word. 
and he, week after week after week, and it went on beyond the six weeks because the guys really enjoyed it, and uh, he didn't say a word. And I remember the first time he spoke, it was a big deal. Like he actually said something in the study. It's very cool. Fast forward a couple more years, and I was sitting with him on one of the mission trips that we took at that time. And we're sitting there that evening, and he's telling me about his faith in Christ. That story is a story of not just one yes, but a series of yeses. Not just word yes, but action yes. He didn't say yes to coming to church, but he started to come. He didn't, he didn't say, uh, well, he did say yes to Bible study by coming, right? But it was his actions more than his words about coming to faith in Jesus. It reminds me of a parable that Jesus told. Jesus told this parable about two sons and the father saying to these two sons, I want you to go out into the field today and work. And the one son said, sure, father, you got it. We'll do, daddy. Goes out and instead of turning right to go into the field, turns left and doesn't go into the field. The other son says, I'm not going in the field. I'm, you, no, I don't want to do that. You're not the boss of me, blah, blah, blah. Goes outside, has a change of heart, and goes to the field and work. And Jesus asked this question, which of those two sons did the will of the father? Was it the one with the right answer or the one whose behaviors were correct? It was that second one. God's grace, right, always precedes our actions. The Holy Spirit initiates, wooing us, calling us, and we respond with a yes or with a no. And Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 10, kind of clarifies this whole thing, I think, for us. This is what it says. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast. For we are God's work uh, masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he has planned for us long ago. Jehovah Jireh, God provides you and me the way to salvation through the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. And then he woos us to himself. He planted eternity in us and he is now wooing us to himself. And we respond by saying yes, by doing yes to following Jesus. Not just with our words, but by the way that we live out our life. The way that we live in him, the way that we live in love. And so this morning, if you have never said yes to Jesus... If you've never invited Jesus to forgive your sin, never asked him to be the leader of your life, now is the right time, the perfect time for you to do this. Last year, I did a message similar to this where we were talking about uh, a commitment to Christ and what that looks like. And, uh, and it was during the lockdown, so it was you know, just me here talking to a camera. And uh, later that week, Marilyn and I were walking through our neighborhood, and a young woman was walking toward us, and she said, Pastor Jeff, and I immediately deduced, she knows me. <laughs> My powers of deduction. <laughs> I didn't recognize her. And she said, um, 
I've been watching your church online since the lockdown. And I just wanted you to know that I prayed that prayer on Sunday. Like, wow. And so we just had this little moment. And um, how cool is that? How cool is that? That somebody heard the message. And I'm sure God was at work in her heart long before she heard that message. And she finally, on her own, said yes. If you have committed your life to Christ, Jesus and the Holy Spirit continue in that prevenient kind of way, initiating next levels of response to each of us. So where is God knocking on your heart these days? What is the door that you need to open to Christ? Maybe it's a door to some hidden sin that you uh, are wrestling with and struggling with and trying to hide from God. Maybe it's some idol, something that you have put as more important in your life than your faith in Christ. Maybe it's some new direction that you feel the Spirit is kind of wooing you towards, pulling you towards, and you haven't said yes yet. So we're going to enter into this time of communion. And I want you to know that communion is not just some ancient ritual or thing that we do as Christians because it's a sacrament. It's more than just a symbol even of Christ's death on the cross. John Wesley, in writing about the Lord's Supper, said this, it is the grand channel whereby the grace of his spirit was conveyed to the souls of all the children of God. Or to put it another way, God initiated this. Jesus initiated this. And as we respond and take it in, God honors and blesses that in our lives. And so on that night, 2,000 years ago, Jesus meeting with his friends in an upper room just before his arrest and crucifixion wanted them to be clear about what all of this meant. And so he picked up bread from the table and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat this. In remembrance of me, this is a symbol, this is a representation of my sacrifice for you, my broken body, broken for you, that you might find forgiveness of sin and respond to eternity that my Father has planted in your heart, the body of Christ. And likewise, Jesus took the cup and he gave it to them saying, this is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. As oft as you shall drink of this cup, do so remembering me, the blood of Christ shed for you. So for those of you who are at home, whatever you have as a symbol, I want you to recognize that it's more than just a symbolic thing. If you haven't already gotten it, I want you to do that today. Maybe you've never done this online, and I want to encourage you to do this today as an act of yes to Jesus. For those of you who are here in the room, 
we're going to invite you to come as you will. There's, you just come up as you will. There's three stations that are here, uh, one on either side and one in the center here. And uh, it's that little communion set. So you'll come up and you'll take one of those and go back to your seat. And as you're ready to take that wafer as the body of Christ and to eat it and to open up that little vial and to drink that juice as a reminder that Christ shed his blood for you. At this time, the table of the Lord is open.